I'm Gia Kokotakis with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for July 8th, 2023. This week, Lawfare featured coverage of recent developments in Middle East security, including Israel's most recent military operation in Jenin, as well as the release of the State Department's After Action Review on Afghanistan. For today's Archive episode, I picked an episode from January 17th, 2015, in which Benjamin Wittes and Matt Waxman sat down with Daniel Reisner to discuss law, security, and peace in the Middle East. They covered everything from the law of targeted killing to the role of morality in operational law and more. I'm Cody Poplin, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, January 17th, 2015. That was Daniel Reisner you just heard former head of the International Law Branch of the Israeli Defense Forces and current partner with Herzog, Fox, and Neiman. This week, Ben and Matt Waxman sat down with Colonel Reisner during his visit to New York for a series of events and discussions on contemporary national security challenges. Reisner continues to advise senior members of the Israeli government. His experiences set up a wide-ranging conversation, touching on everything from Middle East peace to the ethics of targeted killing. It's the Lawfare Podcast, episode number 106, Colonel Daniel Reisner on law, security, and peace in the Middle East. So to the extent that our readers will have heard your name, it is part probably in connection with the targeted killing opinion that you wrote more than a decade ago. But why don't you start by just telling the audience sort of who you are and a little bit about your professional history. You've had your fingerprints in just about everything. So let's just kind of start by, you know, who is who is Daniel Reisner? Uh, I don't think I know how to answer that question, so I'll just go with the bio side. My first career was about 20 years military. Uh, I served the entire term of my professional military career in the International Law Department of the Israeli Defense Forces. And I headed that department for about 10 years. Um, I, I, I was very proud. I am very proud of that part of my career. And I found it probably the most challenging and the most rewarding. Uh, although not financially, but on other, any other aspect part of my career. So, so what is the International Law Department of the Israeli military? Well, it's actually changed a bit since my time. But uh, during my time, we were the only uh, Israeli government legal office dedicated to issues of international law, operational law, which actually meant that for the 10 years I was there as the, as the head, I was the Israeli government's go-to guy for anything operational or international. So I was advising not only the military, which of course all the military, but the Ministry of Defense, Prime Minister's Office, and almost anyone else in the government who had a question would come to us. That situation has changed since then, because since then, uh, some of my former assistants have set up shop as senior international lawyers in the government. Today, there are other dedicated agencies for that in the Israeli government. So today, there are more players in the field, but in my time, we were the only ones. So the major issues that you addressed that have has continuing resonance and importance both in the Israeli context and in the American context are what? Well, the reality is they they cover the entire variety of international law and operational law issues. So I did counterterrorism before anyone else knew what counterterrorism was. I, I, I was responsible for Israeli counterterrorism operations from the legal perspective from 1985. And I did that until I retired in 2004. And that was in a period when there were no books on legal aspects of counterterrorism. I mean, everyone treated terrorism as a criminal offense. And we had to more or less figure out what to do without any external precedent. Um, we had a lot of work on occupied territories because of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So we, we had a lot of work in governing Palestinian population and tr- addressing their concerns. We had a lot of work in, in boundaries. Uh, international boundary making and 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 obviously dispute resolution with our neighbors countries um, peacekeeping u n uh, 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 natural resources water gas oil all of those issues any one of those issues would come in through the door you wouldn't know what you would have on any given day 
Uh, and that's a, a good lead on to the fact that from 1994 onwards, I started my second career in parallel, which was I became a member of Israel's peace negotiation team. And so, and I did that for 10 years in parallel with my military post. And after I retired, I continued as a civilian uh, external consultant to the prime ministers. Uh, and, and so, in some respects, I have a Tolstoy-like career history because I did war and peace, uh, some of them in parallel uh, at the same time. Um, so that was, has been my second career, which more or less died on me last year where the last vestiges of the peace process sort of ended in a low note. Hopefully that will come back, but I, I've been very fortunate. I, I participated in all of the major negotiation rounds with all of our neighbors. So I was one of the senior drafters of the peace treaty with Jordan, and I was one of the, I was a senior negotiator in all of the agreements with the Palestinians to date, including with Camp David and a few other places. So it's been a wild ride. For the last 10 years, I've been in private practice. And I set up shop as uh, as probably Israel's first private practitioner in international law. And it's been fun. And uh, I've, I now divide my time between my private practice, which is sem- partly commercial and partly uh, public international law, and uh, my teaching, university teaching, and my I continue to advise the government on a wide variety of issues. Americans have a particular set of things they associate with national security law. And they will tend to describe the field as national security law, implying a certain domestic quality to it. Israelis, as you have done, tend to describe a lot of what we talk about in terms of national security law, in terms of international law, in terms of how would you describe the difference between being an American national security lawyer in DOD, in, in, in one of the intelligence community agencies, and practicing national security law, or whatever people call it in Israel? Let me start by saying is, today, when I work in a private lawyer capacity, uh, sometimes I represent some of the uh, mega players in the world. So let's say I represented Microsoft, Google, uh, companies like that in, in, in commercial aspects. And when you enter the room and you represent Microsoft, say, uh, and the other party says, well, I don't like your position. I'm pushing back. So one of the things I used to say, which part of the fact that I'm representing Microsoft did you understand? And in some respects, working for the U.S. government in the international law arena feels a lot like that. You represent still, even today, the leading superpower on the planet, at least from our side of the of, of, of picture. And therefore, when you walk into the room and you say, I think something, everyone thinks very carefully before they say we disagree. And it also comes with the feeling of, I, I don't think it's superiority, but I think it's a feeling of strength. In other words, you recognize the fact that you are in a position of strength. An Israeli lawyer working in the same field feels exactly the opposite. Uh, first of all, we have very little domestic aspects to these discussions. We are almost totally focused on the international arena. And when I say international arena, it's you and Europe. That's the international arena we're looking at. Secondly, we are always, or at least we always feel like we are the weak guy in the room. So when we come into an international conference discussing new ideas for international law, almost always I will be the odd man out coming up with all of these statements. Let me give you an example. When I was still in, in government service, uh, I saw that uh, UNESCO had uh, 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 the United Nations Cultural Property uh, uh, Agency uh, was convening a new conference on protection of cultural property in armed conflict. And because I was head of international law, I'd arrange for a small budget so I could fly all over the world and handle such matters without needing to go to a very complicated approval process, which otherwise the military is great at. So I managed to get a little uh, budget approved that I could decide where I go and when. So I just bought a ticket and said, I'm going. I have no idea what they're going to be discussing. It sounds important for us because obviously in my part of the world, cultural property can mean anything from a mosque to anything else. And I wanted to be sure that international are not going in a direction I was unaware of. So I fly to Paris to this conference. No, no idea what I'm going to hear. And I find myself in this big UNESCO uh, uh, conference room. And I have this Israel sign in front of me because I'm an accredited representative of the state of Israel to this conference. And there are about 200 representatives in the room. It's a huge conference. 
and the discussion starts. And the first two speakers all talk about the fact that the existing protections of cultural property in armed conflict are insufficient, and that they should be toned up so that any destruction of cultural property in times of war should be unlawful. And I'm saying to myself, well, that's interesting, but these represent a fringe group, because where the balancing act coming in, when, when, when will we hear the people saying, okay, but we need to also balance the lives of people, etc. And no one's saying that. So after the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th speaker in, 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 in the conference, I request permission to speak, and when my turn comes, I said, look, I, I may be speaking out of context here, but as a military lawyer, I would also like to hear a bit about how you're going to balance between control property and human life. So while I recognize the Mona Lisa is, 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 a, is something we need to, to, to preserve for all generations to come, not every icon in every situation is worth a life of a hundred people. So let's, let's make sure we're balancing here. And only after that statement did I learn that I was the only military lawyer in the room because they had only invited cultural experts and museum curators to the conference. So I'd invited myself. So I had sort of barged into a conference which wasn't planning on inviting international lawyers or military lawyers into the, into the mix. And how were you received? Shock and awe was, I think, the right <laughs> response. Uh, 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 and, and interestingly, the follow-up was that for the next conference, they actually invited all of my international law colleagues who I had immediately emailed and said to them, people, UNESCO is up to something. And when the organizers understood that I was the Israeli troublemaker was behind the fact that all of these military lawyers from all over the world came to the next conference, they decided to adopt the tactic and they appointed me as the head of the drafting committee for the chapter which was supposed to deal with the balancing between military operations and production cultural property. So I was the one who actually drafted that part of the convention, uh, got it through to the end, came up with a compromise arrangement. This is the, uh, sec uh, um, the what called the second protocol to the, to the 1954 convention. And then convinced my government not to sign and ratify because I thought that the, uh, that the balancing act we'd come up with wasn't good enough for Israel, but it was a very good development of international law. So I had uh, these two hats on. That's an example. I was the odd man out in that meeting and being an Israeli, I was used to it. But the reality is it's an uncomfortable feeling. And, and quite often when there are Americans in the room, we like hiding next to Big Brother and sort of, you know, basking in the, in the warm light of the fact that there's a superpower in the room which sometimes agrees with us. Because otherwise it's a very cold and, and, and lonely feeling out there. Talk about the, the process of restraining bad ideas in a government under enormous and consistent stress in national security environments. In 1983, I was uh, on vac summer vacation between my second and third year of law school. And the Israeli army, uh, 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 in its infinite wisdom, uh, uh, decided that the best use for a, a law student with, with an infantry background was to send us to Lebanon. This is the the uh, second year of the Lebanon War, the first Lebanon War, uh, to serve as, as uh, uh, security guards in Israeli bases to protect convoys and stuff like that. So I find myself spending my summer holiday in Lebanon uh, in the security detail with a group of like-minded university students who w were planning on doing something more useful with our time, but that was what the army told us to do. And uh, my days were spent on guard duty, uh, uh, checking, uh, physically checking Lebanese workers going to work into Israel. So I was frisking them in the morning and then spending my nights on, on guard duty. And um, after about two weeks of doing that, uh, the reserve officer who was in charge of our unit ended his reserve duty. And I was called by the unit commander uh, who said, Reisner, I want you to command the squad for the remainder of the, duty, of the, of the period you're here. And I said, thank you, sir, but what are my duties? And said, your responsibility is to make sure that all the guards are in place and the rotations work, etc. And the perk I got was I got a command post. And my command post was a chair and two phones. And one phone was a regular civilian phone with which I could call anyone 
in Israel, which was an incredible perk when you were in Lebanon. So I could talk to my friends and family all the time, and I never had that before. And the other one was a green phone, which was somehow connected to the military network, and I had no idea where it went, and I'd never seen it used before. And so I did that for the next few weeks, and I sort of made sure that everyone was on post, and that the that the shifts changed, and they should, and that the guards went on convoy escorts, and they should, etc. And, and it became a logistical enterprise, which I sort of learned on the go. And one night I was sitting at my command post, actually talking to my mother on the phone. Um, and the green line rang. And it never rang before. So I say to my mother, mommy, wait a minute, I have another call. And I open the line, and I, I, I pick up the phone, and someone on the other line says, who is this? So I say, my name is Daniel Weiser, who is this? He says, my name is General something, I didn't catch his name, I'm the commander of the region. And I said, pleased to meet you, sir, I didn't know what to say. So he says to me the following, he says, there's a suicide squad on the way to your base to attack you, get ready to defend, good luck. And he closes the phone. So I return to my mother on the other line and say, Mommy, I have to close now, I'll call you back later. And I, and I put the phone down. And then I panic. Because I have absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do. I had undergone basic infantry training, I knew how to fire my rifle, I knew even how to fight in a little squad, okay? Defending a IDF base in the south of Lebanon against a suicide squad. No, no training at all. No idea what it's supposed to be. So I sort of fell back on what I viewed as my additional military training, you know, Rambo movies. And I sort of woke up all the guards, opened the ammo bunker, gave out ammunition, made sure everyone knew how to use it. And we doubled up. That's what I could think of. We doubled up on all the all the defensive positions in the base. Now, the base was structured so that we had a circular defensive position. Then we had a 50-yard kill zone, and then we had the external fence of the base. And so we were doubled up on all positions, adrenaline pumping, no one was going to sleep, and and we stayed there for hours. And around 2 a.m. at night, suddenly a Lebanese car pulls up to the external fence. And no cars were supposed to reach that fence, because it's middle of the night in Lebanon, it's a war zone, there are roadblocks all over the place, IDF, Lebanese militia, so I don't get it, where did this car come from? And three Lebanese men and one Lebanese woman get out. I can barely see them at night at that distance. And they shout to us in Arabic, which one of my soldiers understood, so he translated, that she is in labor and they know that we have an ambulance and that I have the authority to transport them to a hospital in Israel to give birth. So we shout back through this translator that there's a perfectly fine Lebanese hospital 20 clicks down the road in Marjayu. So they should go there. And they shout back at us saying that they tried, but the road is blocked and we're the only hope. So then we're in the middle of the night, the middle of Lebanon, and we have this. And I, I, I immediately realized that this is one of two scenarios. Scenario number one, this is a humanitarian situation. And I do have an ambulance and I do have the authority to evacuate her to a hospital in Israel. And so that's option one. Option two, this is the suicide squad I was told about four hours ago on the phone. And we had already seen numerous suicide belts in Lebanon in the early 80s. So this wasn't anything new. And I had no idea what I was supposed to do. Now, you know, Ben, one of the interesting things about the Israeli military is that it is not a volunteer military. It is a conscription military. Which means that the soldiers in the Israeli army are truly a cross-section of Israeli society. You get everything. My unit was more than that. It was all university students. Today, those people are university professors, CEOs of companies, uh, big-time lawyers, etc. So this was a very good group of soldiers. So because I had no idea what I was supposed to do, I immediately looked at all of them. Does anyone have any smart idea what I'm supposed to do? Unfortunately, they were just as smart as me, and not one of them made eye contact with me. Because, and I, I totally understand. I mean, it the thinking was, he was made in command. It's his problem. He'll tell us what to do. And so there I was in the middle of the night, no guidance, no idea, no training. And I had to decide what to do. And at the end of the day, I made two decisions. Maybe in retrospect, I think I would have made different decisions later in life, when I was a long-time serving military officer, etc. Maybe we were older, wiser, with kids. But at that time, in the middle of the night in Lebanon, when I was really scared, my first decision was I couldn't send them away. Not because it didn't seem to be the right thing to do. It was definitely the safer thing to do. I just couldn't do it. Couldn't bring myself to do it. 
having made that first decision, then I had to invent some way to figure out if they're a suicide squad or if they're a humanitarian crisis. And the only idea I could come up with was that someone has to walk up to the fence and physically check. But I also realized that that could be potentially dangerous. And I wasn't brave enough, and I also didn't feel really to be in command of the squad enough to send anyone. Now, if I was a real officer and I was really in command, not an appointed temporary ad hoc commander of the squad, I may have had a different perspective. I think my age had a lot to do with it. Later in life, I wouldn't have a problem sending someone. But I wasn't brave enough to send anyone. I lacked the courage to give an order to someone to go, understanding what it meant. So I decided to go myself. And I remember walking towards, after saying to the machine gunner the following very non-legally correct statement saying, if they move, kill them. Uh, um, uh, I remember uh, uh, chambering uh, around in my automatic rifle and walking up to the people. And I remember every single step of that movement toward the fence. And she was pregnant. And I did evacuate it off of the metro. And uh, now today there's probably a 33-year-old Lebanese man or woman running around who has no idea of the of, of the of the story of when they were born that night in the hospital in Kiryat Shmona in northern Israel. But from that incident, I learned a lot of things. The first thing I learned about the fact how important training is. And the fact that I wasn't trained for that situation. The feeling of helplessness, not to mention panic you get when you're encountering a life-threatening situation where you don't know what you're supposed to do, is something which I took with me later on in life. I also understood that there are no right answers on the battlefield. I mean, it's much easier when you're shot at. You're the, the, the bad guy. So you know what your response is, and you were trained what to do. So when, you, when people shoot at you, you know what to respond. But these situations, you don't know what the right answer is, you are scared, adrenaline is pumping, and you make a snap decision. And that is a really tough thing to do. And I took that with me later on into my military career. And that helped me in a lot of situations where especially after, let's say, a chain of suicide bombings in Israel or similar occasions, and when the blood is boiling and the army says, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do that. And many times I would fall back on that incident and I would say, guys, look, let's remember there are no good answers to the situation we find ourselves in. So let's figure out what's the best answer we can come up with, but not, let's not run in one direction blindly. And I can tell you, and this is a very long answer to your question, there were numerous incidents where, uh, and not only me, a lot of other people, would actually sit in a room and say, let's not do this. Let's tone down our reaction, tone down our response. I know it's something we would want to do, and, uh, and our blood said we need to respond right now, and let's respond forcefully. But in retrospect, we may we want to react differently. I saw my job, in many respects, as to be a voice representing not law necessarily, but let's look at all the options and let's look at what are our moral and legal choices at every single point and then choose the one we can live with. So Daniel, uh, you served as a senior legal advisor for uh, the Israeli uh, targeted killing program policy long before the term targeted killing was associated with uh, American operations against Al Qaeda. Uh, could you talk a bit about um, uh, how the legal arguments, the legal justification for that policy was received at the time? Maybe I should start by explaining how a lawyer got involved in this. Um, I think it won't be a surprise to anyone that many countries over recent history had a track record of finding a way to get rid of high-profile enemies uh, uh, in clandestine operations. And Israel is attributed with many such operations in the 50s, 60s, 70s, etc. Most famous, of course, being the, the uh, uh, series of attempted assassinations of, of Palestinian terrorists after the Munich uh, 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 terror attack and the massacre in the Munich Olympics in 1970. Um, and even during the uh, uh, Second Intifada, there were incidents where high-profile Palestinian uh, terrorists 
died under strange circumstances. For example, one of them, a very famous engineer, who was responsible for almost all of the suicide attacks and all, all of the bombs and IEDs that the Palestinians were using, he died when his cell phone exploded, which was booby trapped. Uh, that was a very well-known, high-profile uh, incident. And none of those incidents actually attracted in the, any international attention because apparently no one cared. However, there was one incident, I think it was on the 30th of December 2000, 2000 when a Palestinian doctor was shot dead in a, the street of his hometown in the West Bank apparently by a long-range sniper rifle. And immediately all of the Palestinians claimed that he had been a peace activist and a good human being and that Israel had shot him and that the, and they killed the wrong man and this was a serious crime. And I remember I read about it in the papers and I immediately called up my colleagues at the various security agencies and said, what is this? Who did this? What is this about? And Israel never admitted that they had killed him, but the response from the various security agencies was, well, this guy wasn't the nice guy everyone is portraying him. Apparently, he was a terrorist leader, and he was responsible for a, for a um, multiple groups of, of terrorist cells in the West Bank. Following that incident, I got a request from the chief of staff of the armed forces saying, Daniel, we would like to know if in the context of the current situation with the Palestinians, are we allowed to openly target Palestinian terrorists? And this was the type of question, you know, you get, for this I went to law school, I mean, <laughs> and, and the first response was, are you sure you want to ask the question? Because no one had ever asked such a question before, and I don't think in any other military anyone had been asked that question. And they said yes, because there's a lot of flack coming out of this incident. And we want to know if such a tactic is actually lawful or not. And so we actually sat down and started thinking about the question, can armies legitimately target senior operational terrorists on the other side? And our conclusion was that the answer depended on the classification of the conflict. If you were in a law enforcement situation, then the answer is no, because in law enforcement you can't kill a suspected criminal. But if you are in an, in an armed conflict scenario, then you are definitely allowed to target an enemy. So the classification became crucial. Now, we had actually previously to that already designated the ongoing Second Intifada for a variety of very powerful reasons as an armed conflict. So we said, on the basis of that classification, that there is now an armed conflict between Israel and a non-state entity, it is a legitimate derivative that you can then say that they are enemy combatants. And that means that you can legitimately target them. But then we came up with five conditions. And we wrote those in a then confidential opinion, which later became public. And the five conditions were the following. Condition number one, in every terrorist organization, oh, let me start somewhere else, okay? Uh, in Between armies, theoretically, every uniform member of an army is a legitimate target. Even a military lawyer or, or uh, is it, uh, while he may have no military value whatsoever, he's still a legitimate target. We were unclear what the answer is for these type of terrorist groups. So we drew some circles and we said, well look, at the core group we have the commanders of the, of, of, of the organization. Around them you have the second circle is the actual fighters or what or terrorists, what you want to call them. The third group is a support group, the logistics, the, the engineering, the uh, whatever. And the fourth group is the political, maybe even the financial supporters. And we said, to play it safe, let's only go after the first two core groups. The commanders and the actual fighters themselves. Although we could make an argument for circle number three, we're doing something here which no one has publicly done before. So let's make sure we go in the group so there will be no argument about the legitimacy of the target. So we said the first condition was only these two circles and only when you have absolutely certain evidence of their involvement in those circles. So that was condition number one. Condition number two was something we totally invented. 
And not only totally invented, it's actually in contravention of the laws of war. We said the following. You will only allow you to use this if you have no viable possibility to arrest. Now in warfare, there is absolutely no requirement of arrest. You can call someone to surrender if you want, but you have no requirement to do so. And if you see him from three miles away, you can fire a missile and kill him without even, even knowing he's most targeted. It's totally legitimate. We said here in this special case, because we're walking in uh, uncharted territory, really, if you have a viable arrest opportunity, you must take it as a matter of policy. Which means we'll only allow you to do this if you will prove to us that you exhausted the possibilities of a viable arrest. Condition number three was a derivative of condition number two. Because of this arrest requirement, we will never allow you to do this in any territory which Israel controls. Because you will not accept an argument from you saying that while we have security control over this region, we don't have a viable arrest opportunity. Bring 10,000 soldiers and jump the guy. Don't tell me you can't do that. So as a practical matter, this means yes in Gaza, yes in areas fully controlled by the Palestinian Authority, but no in territories in which Israel retains security control. Or in Israel proper. Or in Israel proper. Yes, absolutely, exactly. So, that was condition three. Then condition number four, we go back to the laws of armed conflict. And we said, um, look, we uh, 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 must ensure that the principle of proportionality be applied to all such attacks, which means minimize, minimize, minimize any collateral damage to civilians or, 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 when, you, when you target these individuals. And again, we said so because it was clear to us a, that this is a legal requirement. But there's also another requirement, and that is the policy requirement. Contrary to what some people believe, Israel has a vested interest in minimizing Palestinian collateral damage because every time we target someone and a Palestinian civilian is injured or killed, in addition to the fact that we just injured an innocent person, we get hit in the international arena. And we get hammered for it. So we have a vested interest to keep the dominoes for a variety of reasons. But there's also a legal requirement. So we said this is a LOAC type of attack, so you must apply by these principles. And that was condition number four. And the final condition was one I invented on the basis of my relatively long career by that time. I wanted to keep the numbers low. I wanted each one of these things to be extremely unique and special. And one of my concerns was that if we created a procedure which would be easy to use, it could be almost automated into the Israeli military structure. And we didn't want that. So we added the following policy decision, that any such attack would need to be personally approved by the Minister of Defense or the Prime Minister which means no official, no non-elected official, no chief of staff, no head of Shabak, no army general could approve any of this. They could, they would be part of the chain of approval, but we would require them to go to the political leadership to do this. And this was extraordinarily important because that meant the numbers would remain low. And so those were the five conditions that we came up with in 2000, 2001. All of which brings us back to Matt's question, how was this received prior to its essential adoption by the United States? In the Israeli side, uh, it was received by the army with the following. A, thank you for this. Interesting. But some of your conditions are very difficult to implement. So, for example, we get your circle. But what does a viable arrest opportunity actually mean? How many soldiers do we need to endanger before you tell me that the arrest was not viable? Secondly, this proportionality thing. How does one do this apples and oranges type of proportionality balancing act? Uh, uh, and, and they said to us, and then they actually said the following, do you mind joining us in the room and helping us make these determinations? And this was the first time ever that an Israeli military lawyer was invited by the military to join the operation. And so that was a revolutionary event for us. And actually, I had a lot of questions of whether we should do that. I knew what the American model was. In fact, I sort of started copying it. But I recognized that by coming into the room, you change the dynamics. Because now you have a lawyer in the room. And if the lawyer says it's okay, the commander's off the hook. So with that in mind, we had a very complicated internal dialogue. 
and I actually went to the Israeli Attorney General and said, look, they've invited me to the room, and I think I should go, and I'll tell you why I think I should go. Because if the army is saying, we want to make sure that we make the right decisions in advance, come into the room and help us make sure we do that, I think it's my job to come into the room and help them do that. And he said, Daniel, I'm concerned. I'm concerned because the lawyer should be doing an ex post facto review of this. But to be part of the process from the get-go, that's a tough one. So I, I'm not in favor of that. So what we agreed at the end was that the military lawyers would do it, and the civilian lawyers would do the after-action review, uh, uh, which would be sort of a separation of powers. And from that point forward, we were part of the operational side of, of the Israeli military. And, and, and we did that consistently, and I have to say, some of the toughest decisions I was ever involved with were those. The overseas reaction? Okay. First in, initial reaction of the various governments we talked to was, what? Uh, not officially, they would say, these are things you do in quietly, clandestine operations. You don't do them publicly. On the record, they'd say, we are shocked at the fact that you are now moving to a lo to, from the law enforcement model to an armed conflict model. Let me give you probably the best example for a U.S. audience. Um, as we previously discussed, I was a senior negotiator in the Israeli peace negotiations. And I was one of the Israeli negotiators at the Camp David talks, the unsuccessful Camp David talks in 2000. In, in here. And when we came back, the Second Intifada uh, uh, erupted, and, you know, and, 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 and the peace process sort of started dying. Out. President Clinton decided uh, 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 to try to help save the peace process. And so he decided to set up a um, commission uh, headed by his longtime friend, Senator George Mitchell. And that commission was given a dual goal. One is to identify who was to blame for the eruption of the uh, uh, Second Intifada, which was thought was a very bad question to ask, because no matter what result they come up with, someone is going to become a friend. Was it Arafat? Was it Ariel Sharon? Was it someone else? The second question, which I thought was the right question to ask, was how does one get the peace process back online? And so Senator Mitchell and his team came to Israel, and they talked to everyone. And I was one of the people they interviewed. This was my first meeting with Senator Mitchell. And I actually explained to them the fact that we had moved from a law enforcement model to an armed conflict situation. And one of the things I also explained to them was the consequence of that. Was a lot, there were a lot of consequences, including, of course, targeted killing. Okay. Interestingly, the Mitchell Committee published a report, I think, on May 1st, 2001, when George Bush Jr. was now president of the United States after Clinton was no longer in office. And that report, which is available online, actually dedicated two paragraphs to my presentation on the question of the definition of the situation with the Palestinians as an armed conflict. And Mitchell actually rejected my position, saying that there was an armed conflict with the Palestinians, saying that this Israeli characterization was overly broad and strongly recommended that Israel go back to the old system, which was the law enforcement, uh, military police investigations, and treating each incident on a singular basis and not a generic armed conflict approach. And I try not to be cynical, but it took four months and four aircraft to change the mind of the U.S. government by 180 degrees. So the same thing was true of our targeted killing policy. Uh, uh, it was received with understanding, but disquiet by all of our friends until 9-11. Suddenly, post 9-11, we become the flavor of the month. So, and can, well, can, can I ask about an aspect of this, uh, an aspect of targeted killing? It's a, a, a general aspect of, of targeting law, uh, certainly one that's attracted a lot of controversy with recent operations in Gaza. You've referred to it before, earlier, uh, uh, is, is the principle of proportionality, something I would imagine is an extremely difficult uh, 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 issue on which to provide operational legal advice. Could you talk a little bit about your experience in that regard? Yeah. So first, for the sake of the, I assume that we have a very uh, educated uh, audience on these issues, but for the sake of, of putting everyone on the same playing field, the principle is the following. It's when you launch an attack, you must ensure 
that the military advantage anticipated as a result of the attack is greater than, actually equal to or greater, I think is the formula, than the anticipated potential damage to civilians and uh, casualties, uh, civilian casualties. Now that's an apples and oranges formula if I saw one, uh, because there's no real metric to gauge military advantage on the one hand, and there's no real way to estimate the potential civilian casualties on the other, and yet you suppose somehow in a battlefield situation to find a way to balance between the two and decide if the military advantage is greater. Strangely enough, in reality, sometimes this principle is easier to implement than you would think. So let me give you an extreme example. Let's say a uh, hundred enemy soldiers and one civilian next to them. Obviously, you're allowed to target that group, even if there's one civilian, because compared to the overall military advantage, uh, that's a legitimate attack under the rule of proportionality. And the reverse would be equally true. A hundred civilians and, a, and an enemy soldier among them is an easy question, because obviously you can't target. But if we move into the gray zone, what if that one sole officer is the chief of staff of the enemy army, and he's in the middle of a crowded market? That's where the questions become tricky. And the problem is there's no answer, no guidebook, no rule book, no book of precedence you could choose. So every military has to come up with its own system to answer this question. Um, I was once asked by the chief of staff to sit on a group in the army, which was supposed to look at these type of questions from a combined legal moral approach. And our group included uh, a senior general, a senior ethics professor, and myself. Each one of us coming of it from a different perspective. Operational ethics and law all sitting together. And we created a, a, a thought exercise for proportionality. And the thought exercise went as follows. Let's assume that there is a terrorist in Gaza today who is planning an attack tomorrow somewhere in Israel. And in that attack, he's going to kill one Israeli person. Just one. But that attack is going to succeed 100% of the time. He's got a foolproof plan to attack. And that's going to happen tomorrow. We now have a window of opportunity to kill that guy. Now, in, for, to, in order to clear the, the air, all of the victims and people involved are single males above the age of 18. So no children involved, no families involved. We, we, this is a thought uh, 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 experiment. And the question we asked ourselves, how many similar 18 plus year old single civilians are we willing to have die in that attack we can launch today, which will 100% kill that terror? And we were asked, each one of us asked to write a number of how many innocent civilians you could justify using the proportionality principle to stop that attack. And there's no answer to that. I can tell you that we then took all the numbers on the pieces of paper and averaged them out, and the answer came out pi, 3.14. And I've run that exercise numerous times in various places, and I can now tell you that my experience is the following. The younger you are, the higher the number. The less children you have, the, la the higher the number. The more military battlefield experience you have, the lower the number. Lots of interesting dynamics I've seen in Israel. This links a bunch of themes that you've been talking about. You know, one, one sense in which you sound very different from most American national security lawyers is that you explicitly integrate moral considerations into the way you think about these questions and into the substantive guidance that you end up giving. Now, a lot of American national security lawyers will listen to that and say, hey, the morality of this is not my job. My job is to describe what's legally available. Uh, you have a very different attitude about it, and I'd just like to br bring that together a little bit. And what is, what is the role of, the, of, of morality in advising legal advice to operations? I don't have a generic answer to that, but I'll tell you what my answer is. Uh, and this is an answer I developed over my career, and this is the way I, I did my job and continue to do it today when I'm asked for advice on these issues. 
Um, every time someone comes to me with a question, can we do X? I have a three-tiered test. Tier number one is, is it a good idea? And is it a good idea is a question which is not always asked. And that is the type of question I learned to ask because I saw many bad ideas be thrown in the air, especially in times of crisis. And so I usually ask the question, wait a minute, explain to me the potential military, strategic, tactical, operational value of this idea. What will it actually do? I can share with you that um, before the last round in Gaza, I remember there were three young Israeli kids who were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists and later we learned murdered. And the Israeli government was under a lot of pressure to respond forcibly to Hamas. And a lot of ideas were thrown in the Israeli cabinet. Now, I don't work for the government anymore, but I'm still a consultant to the government and they call me quite often. And the prime minister called me up on the phone. And he said, Daniel, you know that we're thinking of doing something. I won't mention what it is. And, and I've heard from the senior government lawyer that you think it's, we shouldn't do it. He was in the cabinet meeting. He called me up from the cabinet meeting. He said, why don't you think we should do it? And I said, Mr. Prime Minister, what you're suggesting to do, I could defend in court and I will win. But I don't think it's a good idea from a military perspective. I don't think it actually does anything good for security in Israel. It may look good in the press. And we, we talked through it for 10 minutes. He said, you know what, I agree with you. And then he decided not to do it. So I've learned the value of asking the question, even though I'm the lawyer and I'm not the, I'm a military colonel, but my specialty is the law. And I, I've learned you have to ask that question. Sometimes they will rethink the idea. The next test, once I come to the conclusion it's a good idea, is my morality test. Now, I have a very simple morality test. I don't know anything about morality and ethics. I, I, that's not my area of specialty. So my test is very simple. Is this something I can live with? Is this something I can go to sleep at night and say I have to do this? If the answer is no, I won't support it. And, and, and this is a, 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 a litmus test for me because it's a reality check. I need to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the direction going on. And, and one of the things that this te- these two first tiers helped me is they helped me go through a very formalized decision-making process in times where usually organized decision-making process are not the norm, especially in crisis. If I pass test one and I pass test two, now I get to the law. And here, let me be frank with you, Ben. Uh, there are three colors of situations. There's white, there's black, and there's gray. If it's white, do it. Because it's a good idea and it's moral and it's also legal. I'll be very happy for you to do this. If it's black, this is one of those rare situations where I actually say to my clients, it's a good idea. I actually support it. Unfortunately, the law doesn't allow us to do this. I think the law is bad, but this is what the law says we can't do. I have said that on several occasions. If it's gray, and it passed my first two tests. This is really why I say, people, you need to understand. This is gray. But because it's a good idea and it's a moral idea, we will do our best to defend it. And that's how I view a government lawyer's job of explaining the limitations, making sure the decision-making process is robust, and then doing his best to defend the interest. So we use the name of our site, as you know, Lawfare, which we take as a somewhat serious and somewhat playful reference both to law as a weapon of conflict and also to law about war and war over over law. Um, In Israel, the term lawfare has a much more uh, dark connotation than we use it on the site. Um, I'm interested for your sense of both the way the word is used in Israel, but also sort of the environment for the set of issues that it conveys right now. First of all, when I joined up in the early 80s to the military, um, what I knew about conflict was that it was waged on two fronts. You had the military front and you had the political front with a capital T. And as Clausewitz once noted, one was the continuation of the other. not entirely clear which one continues and which one. Um, and all of our conflicts with our neighbors were fought on those two levels. So we had the military 
battlefield, which we usually win or at least come out with a relatively good draw. And you have the political battlefield, where surprisingly enough, we still usually win at the end of the day. All of that changed in the late 1980s, uh, when the rise of global media created uh, a third battlefield, the battlefield of public opinion and international media. And that battlefield has been the one where we've consistently lost. And I won't go into the dis discussion of why we lost that so emphatically, but we have lost it. And today, in that battlefield, the David and Goliath syndrome is reversed. So we are portrayed quite often as a Goliath and, and our neighbors as the Davids of the world. Now, I only mention this because losing the public opinion battlefield has three direct consequences. One, it impacts on the political uh, uh, battlefield, because if you are portrayed as a bad guy on the public opinion front, politicians around the world are less likely to be openly supportive of your cause, because they're thinking of their own elections and of their own public opinion. So you shouldn't be surprised to see that for the last 20 years, very few European leaders have publicly spoken pro-Israel, in spite of the fact that privately, most of them are actually pro-Israel because they want to get re-elected, so they know it's not the right thing to say. On the military front, there have been some countries who have been discussing whether or not they should minimize or limit military aid to Israel. Uh, there is currently a discussion in the UK, for example, about demand from pro-Palestinian groups that a, a, a limitations be imposed on export to Israel of certain military equipment. And some uh, North European countries have also imposed similar restrictions. So that's another derivative of this, again, this public opinion battlefront. But the third, and in the US, I think, rather less known consequence of losing that public opinion battlefield, is that the normative, normal people of the world, the ones like you and us, uh, who care about good and bad and right and wrong and law and order, say to themselves, if these people are the bad guys, why are they walking around free? And so, the third consequence is that there are some people who have decided that the legal battlefield should also be incorporated into the mix. Now, add to this that in the year 2000, at the NGO, anti-Israeli NGO conference in Durban, South Africa, um, all of these anti-Israeli groups decided to launch a campaign of delegitimization of the state of Israel. And they recognized that they couldn't do it to us on the, on the political and on the military battlefield, but they identified the legal and economic battlefield on the basis of the South African model as a very effective avenue. And they launched what is called the BDS campaign, the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions campaign. And so what happened was that that launched a very aggressive lawfare campaign against Israel, which has two origins. One is a specific intentional decision by anti-Israeli groups to wage legal war against Israel using any and all means. And two, uh, uh, a supporting group of actually very reasonable, normal people from Europe primarily, who buy into the public opinion narrative of the Israelis being the bad guys and saying, this is the cause we would like to support, and let's use our own enforcement mechanisms to do that. And this has created an entirely new battlefield, the lawfare front for Israel, which is absolutely no joking matter, which includes a variety of avenues of attack, which I can't describe, uh, and which is, while not an existential threat, a very serious and credible legitimization threat to the, to the state of Israel. Okay, so let's break that down. First of all, let's identify the areas of attack. Uh, the first attempts were to try to prosecute, indict Israeli uh, leaders in a variety of international and national courts. And the first attempt uh, took place in 1999 when uh, a group of Lebanese origin uh, Belgian citizens filed a criminal complaint in Belgium against Ariel Sharon, who was then a presiding minister in the Israeli government, for his alleged involvement in the Sabra and Shatila massacre in 1982. Now, to put things in context, 
the suburb Shatila Massacre in 1982 uh, was when a group of Christian militias uh, uh, committed a horrible massacre in a group of Palestinian refugee camps. And the allegation against Israel was that Israel had been in control of the region at the time and A, should have known about it in advance and stopped it, and B, uh, 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 didn't do enough uh, once it became clear that it was going on. And Israel actually launched its own commission, national commission of inquiry into this, which reached a very clear conclusion that Israel did not know it was happening until it was too late. But one of the things that the commission recommended was that Ariel Sharon no longer serve as minister of defense. And, and that implied some feeling that he should have done better in that respect, especially if there was a secret part to that report which was never published, which people can theorize what it included, but probably only included more of the same. But the general spe thought was that Ariel Sharon should have somehow prevented this or been more active in preventing. So on the basis of that evidence alone, these Lebanese people said, Ariel Sharon must be somewhat implicated because they fired him as Minister of Defense after that incident. So we want you to prosecute him for the, the, mass, the massacre. And the Belgian authorities, instead of saying we're not touching this, used the very wide Belgian principle in universal jurisdiction to take the case on. And I found myself, this was my first lawfare case, 1999. And I found myself as part of the Israeli team. I was head of international for the Israeli military, so obviously it was part of my job description to be part of that team. And we d we started defending the case in front of the Belgian authorities. And when we said to the Belgian government, guys, this is a highly politicized complaint. It has very little legal merit. So why are you taking it on? They responded, to be fair, saying, look, we have a very clear separation of, of powers here. And the, our prosecution and our judges are independent. We can't touch this. So we found ourselves defending these cases before a variety of Belgian courts. And it was quite clear that our position was not being accepted. And I think we were quite confident that the case was moving towards a potential in absentia uh, uh, court case. And then sometimes fate intervenes. The Arab sources identifying Belgium as a very interesting place to wage legal war decided to step it up a notch and they filed a similar complaint against Donald Rumsfeld for the U.S. war crimes in the Second Gulf War. And again, the Belgian authorities, instead of throwing this out, said, well, this is a serious complaint, let's take it to court. And I have a friend in the former senior official in the U.S. State Department who told me about a discussion which was held between the U.S. government and the Belgian authorities where they asked them, why are you guys taking this on? And they responded again, saying, we have a separation of powers and the prosecution and judges are independent. Interestingly enough, that friend also told me that in another discussion, uh, the U.S., after giving it some thought, said, we recognize the importance of this separation of powers, and we will respect it, and we won't complain again. And in a totally unrelated subject, we just wanted to inform you that we have decided that NATO headquarters will be leaving Brussels in the next few weeks to a new, uh, yet to be identified European location. And this has absolutely nothing to do with this previous case. And, and obviously, within 10 days, the Belgian parliament retroactively annulled the universal jurisdiction law. And by doing so, actually got rid of the Rumsfeld case, but also got rid of the Ariel Sharon case. And was there anxiety in Belgium about throwing the Sharon out with the, um, uh, with, with the um, Rumsfeld bathwater? Or was it, or was it a relief to the Belgian authorities to be rid of the problem? I don't actually know. Um, because I wasn't involved in the negotiations with the Belgian government directly, so I didn't see or feel the atmosphere of the discussion. I think the government was glad to get rid of this case, overruling the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. And the prosecutors wanted it because it seemed to make sense to them. And we've seen a repeat performance of this type of dynamic since. And maybe, so, as I explained, this was the first such case, but we had several dozen since. Uh, none of them went to court, but there were attempts to prosecute, to launch investigations against Israeli leaders in a variety of jurisdictions. And in all cases, the pro-Arab slash Palestinian complainants identified countries which either had a wide universal jurisdiction clause, 
or had cases where judges had uh, wide authority to issue uh, arrest warrants under local legislation. So they were looking for the holes in the net where they could come in, uh, uh, file what I would view as generally unsubstantiated complaints, highly politicized in nature, and find prosecutors or judges who are politically aligned with the with the concept who would be willing to take this on, usually as a good career move. Because if you take that on, you make a name for yourself. Okay, so, so attack avenue number one is universal jurisdiction, criminal indictment. Yes. What else we got? Then you try to do the same thing of international criminal court. As I was the senior lawyer in the Israeli government discussing the ICC, we recognized this in advance, and that was our primary reason of joining the court in the first place, because they knew it would be used against us the moment we joined. And so there were numerous attempts to try to invoke ICC jurisdiction long before the current round. And, and, and the primary attempt was about four years ago when the Palestinian Minister of Justice actually sent a letter to the former prosecutor, Ocampo, and said to him that Palestine accepts the court's jurisdiction. Can you take on the Israeli case? Now, this is another interesting example. Ocampo had actually publicly stated that, he had, that the court has no jurisdiction on the Israeli-Palestinian dispute two weeks before that letter came in. And he explained the reason why not, because the court jurisdiction requires one of five cases. Either the offense be committed in the territory of a state party, no, or in the territory of a non-state party which has acquiesced to the jurisdiction of the court, no, or the offense was allegedly committed by a citizen of a state party, no, or, or alleged or committed by a citizen of a non-state party which had acquiesced, no, or which had been uh, referred to the ICC by the Security Council, no. So, when none of the five potential uh, uh, avenues for ICC jurisdiction are met, he very clearly said, we have no jurisdiction of the Israeli Palestinian dispute. Suddenly, this letter comes in from the Palestinian, and instead of repeating what he said just two weeks earlier in an interview, he says, this is a serious matter, I'll take it under advisement. And then he sits on it for over two years. During those two years, he becomes an international known figure. No one knew who he was until then. He was the prosecutor of the ICC who was prosecuting Africans. But the moment he took on this issue, he became an international celebrity. And he was on every single talk show, every single international legal conference. Why? Because he's the guy who's thinking about prosecuting Israel for war crimes. That's all you needed. Interestingly enough, he sat in it for over two years. And then a few months before he retired, to take up, I think, a teaching position at Harvard, uh, uh, which he could do, I think, on the basis of being the guy who was thinking about prosecuting Israel. Uh, 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 he then rendered an opinion saying, I don't have jurisdiction, which is the same opinion he gave two weeks before the letter came in, but it, but it took him two years to, to send it out, and he sent it out with an interesting proviso saying, my opinion could change if, in the future, Palestine is given a non-member state uh, recognition by the UN, and Which then he leaves, and then it happened, and so now the ICC becomes a much more strong, uh, important issue because now we have that legacy. So that was the second attempt, and I can tell you there were numerous attempts to take Israelis to the ICC. Perhaps the most anecdotal I could mention: one of my former assistants, um, a Israeli lieutenant colonel, uh, who was South African born, and he made immigrated to Israel late on in life. After one of the operations, the recent operations in Gaza, in which he was absolutely not involved, by the way, uh, when he was in Gaza, pro-Palestinian groups filed a criminal complaint against him for his alleged involvement in Israeli war crimes. And again, I know he wasn't even serving in, in a capacity related to the Gaza operation. In fact, I think he was in leave during the entire operation. And he was only brought in later to go and give some talks in South Africa about legal issues which arose in that operation. So the South African authorities were handed this hot potato by South African pro-Palestinian groups claiming that this guy was a war criminal. And they very politely, and I think very correctly, did the, did the following. They waited until he left South Africa. And then they said, well, now that he's no longer here, we see no public interest in pursuing this matter, which I thought was a very wise move. But the pro-Palestinian groups recognizing that the South Africans wouldn't play along with it. Then they went to The Hague and filed a complaint in the, uh, before the ICC against the guy and claimed that because he has 
dual citizenship, Israeli and South Africa, they could do that because South Africa is an ICC member. So this is just another example of the various attempts to get Israel before the ICC, which to date have consistently failed. So that's track two. Track three. Track three is, let's forget the criminal side. Uh, there's one country in the world where you can actually sue someone for human rights violations, and that's the United States of America. So pro-Arab groups try to sue senior Israeli officials for alleged human rights violations in the U.S. courts. Under the Alien Tort Statute. Exactly. All of them fail, and in return, pro-Israeli groups are now suing like crazy Palestinian terrorists, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iran, and others in U.S. courts, but we learned the trick from them. I mean, they started. So... So now you see an entire gamut of these type of cases over there, which some people support and some don't support because it may legitimize this type of activity. But it's an ongoing practice now. I see it going on all the time. So that was track three, which currently doesn't work anymore. And then you go to the second circle. Now, the second circle is, in some respects, scarier. Because what the BDS movement realized um, it's going to be very difficult to target Israelis for a variety of reasons. But why don't we target the non-Israelis who are supportive of Israel? Because those have a lower threshold for caving in. And so they created a list of international corporations who work with Israel, and they went after them. And let me give you, I think, the most frightening example of them all. And this is a rather long anecdote, so I apologize, but I think it's an incredible story. Um, in October 2010, in the Dutch city of Rotterdam, in the morning of a Friday, early morning, there was a knock on the door, I think 6 a.m., on the door of a very prominent Dutch businessman. So he goes and opens the door, I think in his pajamas, and he finds close to 100 non-uniformed Dutch policemen standing outside his door with an investigative judge who explained that they have a warrant to search his premises. Now, this guy is shocked. He has no idea what this is about. So while they're walking, he asks them in Dutch, uh, what am I suspected of having done? And they say to him in Dutch, war crime. Now, this guy is the son of a Holocaust survivor. So that doesn't sort of, you know, that's not the right type of thing you want to hear Friday morning in your house. And the Dutch police go through his entire house. They seize all documents, computers, etc. And they do it for a long time. Later, they discover they did that to the house of his Dutch partner, to the offices of the three different companies in his group, the insurance agents, who were insured the group. I mean, hundreds of Dutch policemen carried out this incredibly large raid, totally coordinated. Later, we would learn this would be after several months of wiretapping of all people involved by the Dutch authorities and a one-year clandestine investigation, apparently the largest in the history of the Netherlands since World War II, and the, and the first ever Dutch war crimes investigation under the new 2007, I believe, Dutch war crimes. And what's the story? The story is as follows. A year before, pro-Palestinian groups filed the following complaint. That Dutch group of companies is the largest retail a uh, 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 renter and seller of cranes and lifting platforms in Europe. Okay? And it has subsidiaries and, 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 and uh, uh, all over the world. It's a very large European company. One of its subsidiaries was in Israel. And what that subsidiary does as its regular business was to rent out cranes and lifting platforms to Israeli construction companies for any and all projects. It's like the AVs, Hertz, budget and, and, and all of the construction world. And apparently, uh, uh, pro-Palestinian human rights groups had identified six incidents where equipment rented out by that subsidiary was used by Israeli companies to carry out activities in the West Bank, such as possibly uh, constructing the Israeli security fence or maybe building a, 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 a factory in the settlement. And the, and, the, and the human rights organization complaint said, the security fence and the settlements are war crimes, which is not a legal situation, but that doesn't matter. That's what they're doing. And so this Dutch company, by renting out equipment through its Israeli subsidiary to Israeli companies, had aided and abetted the perpetration of war crimes. 
On the basis of that complaint alone, the Dutch prosecution launched the largest investigation I understand in the history of the Dutch prosecution, international order, which ended with that surprise search and seizure at the home of that person. That company then hired me to serve as the uh, uh, general counsel for these proceedings. And I managed that case for three years. And during those three years, we filed numerous legal submissions to the Dutch prosecution, explaining to them that they had no case. For so many reasons, I can't even elaborate. I mean, it's, it's an incredibly long list of arguments. And they rejected every single one of our arguments. By the way, I didn't just write them myself. I mean, I got senior international scholars to support everything we said, including, I won't mention names, but the former president of the ICJ. And the Dutch prosecution response was always the same. Uh, um, you may have a point in international law, but this is a Dutch law question. And we think we have a strong case on the Dutch law. And then we tried Israeli political pressure. And the Dutch were very sympathetic to the Israeli government. because. And why did I bring in Israeli political pressure? Not because of the Dutch company, but because the hidden assumption among the case was obviously that Israel was committing more crimes. Otherwise, the Dutch company couldn't aid and abet anything. So this was a almost given side effect of the case was that Israel is committing war crimes and now we're prosecuting the Dutch company. And so the Israeli government had a vested interest saying, what on earth are you saying? And the Dutch government was sympathetic, but they said something we'd heard before. Uh, our prosecutors are independent. So we can't help. And I respect that. That's a, it's a right to say. We won that case. We got the uh, um, uh, the Dutch prosecution to back down and to close down the investigation after we convinced them that they had no case. But the way we won that case included, frankly, going to the U.S. and getting the U.S. involved as well. And the U.S. was involved because the manufacturers of all of the equipment, which was distributed by that Dutch company, were U.S. companies. And so the realization was that if the Dutch distributor is potentially aiding and abetting a war crime. Why isn't the U.S. manufacturer doing the same? And so what we got was, we got so much pressure on the Dutch government that they, at the end of the day, said, you know what, we don't, we're closing this down. But that was a huge fight. Three years. And it could have gone either way. And are there other cases like it? Yes. But I can't tell you what they are because they're still ongoing. Daniel, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure, and as an avid reader of Lawfare, you know, all I can say is I'm glad to be a part of this. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, please spread the word and promote the Lawfare podcast via your social networks on Twitter, Facebook, email, and in any other way you can. Thanks for listening. <laughs>